We find our gospel lesson in the book of Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 32. Hear now the word of the Lord. This is Jesus and his disciples that the passage is speaking about. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed him were afraid. He took the twelve aside and again began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Norms and values. Norms and values are interesting things. In my family, Duane often opens the door for me. We always say thank you to each other. And God bless you or bless you when the other sneezes. He gets very upset when someone in the church calls me Mrs. Jackson. And I am very protective of him because he is a good man and deserves respect. Those are norms and values that we uphold, he and I. Some we were taught from the time we were young children. Others we learned as part of the culture that we were raised in. And then others we simply maintain ourselves because they are meaningful to us as a family. Norms and values, they are so important. We need them to help us find common ground upon which we can all coexist and be in community together. Sometimes they are so ingrained that we don't even realize that that's what it is. And how difficult it is to unlearn them. For example, in our country, we shake hands with our right hand. We don't know why. I mean, I don't know why. It was just something we do. That's what we're taught to do. Everyone does it in our country. We shake hands with our right hand. Now imagine going somewhere where everyone shook hands with their left. Just thinking about that makes my head hurt. 
Every time you met someone, you'd have to remember, no, no, stick your left hand out. Oh, stick your left hand out. Why do we want to think about something that we've never thought about before? You meet someone, you stick your right hand out. You shake their hand. Some norms and values are so ingrained in us, and they become very difficult to unlearn. Now, you may ask, well, why would we want to unlearn something that we find value in? Oh, well, because we change over time. And there are some things that we learn and we grow. And therefore, we act differently. In my former church, I'll give you an example, they have this huge book. It's dusty, it's old. When you touch it, pumes of dust just flies off of it and it leaves this red dust all over your hands and clothes. And when you open it, the book has the names of all the members of the church from the early 1900s. For all the married women, their names are listed in there. But their names are Mrs. Anthony Johnson, Mrs. Albert Thomas, Mrs. Stephen Adams. Do you see what I'm saying? what I'm doing. Back in those days, the norm was women who were married were called by their husband's names. Nobody even knows what their names are anymore. Because everything, the roll book, the minutes, the, the, the banquet knows, everything has them as their husband's name. I can imagine over time, society began to think differently about women, especially married women that they had a sense of independence about them, that they were their own women and should be recognized as such. But I'm sure that that did not come easy. <laughs> I'm sure that there were those who were pushing back and saying, it was good for my mother, it was good for my grandmother, it's good enough for me. This is what we've always done and this is what we always should do. But little by little, society began to surrender their ingrained beliefs in order to live into a new way of understanding the status of women. So today we list married women by their given names. And sometimes we even list them by their maiden names. And what's interesting about it is that for most, if not all of us, we would consider it strange to do otherwise. Change. Change is possible. What makes unlearning these norms and values so hard is that it requires surrendering. It requires surrendering that which we have always believed in order to make room for the new, a type of conversion of our heart and the things that we believe, of our mind and the things that we think. And it doesn't come easy. We have to strive for it. We have to work at it because it's not going to happen instantly. Christians, people who follow Jesus, we have norms and values also. It's not anything new. We, we have norms and values, and sometimes they even clash with the culture around us. It has always been that case from the very beginning. We have only to read the Gospels to realize that this is the work Jesus undertook throughout his ministry, helping his followers to understand, to see, and to live new values and new norms of the kingdom of God, and being moved and motivated so that they too would surrender their old cultural norms for these new values, these new norms. Jesus did this by his teachings. Remember his teachings in the parables? We, I, I'll give you an example. Care for the least among you, as though you are caring for him. That's a norm. That's a, a value that is so important to the Christian faith. He taught it in his sermons. Blessed are people who are poor, who are merciful, who are humble, Poor peacemakers. He used his interactions with people as teachable moments. 
Do you remember the time when the woman came with the, with the, the alabaster jar? And the person that he went to the house with is sitting there and, and talking so badly about her and in his mind, and Jesus realizes it. He says, you gave me nothing, but she has given me everything. He's teaching him how to honor people who we would necessarily look down upon. It's another value. The things that Jesus taught shows us how hard it is sometimes to be a Christian. Because oftentimes these norms, these values, turn our cultural norms and values upside down. One of the values of the king of the kingdom of God is service. I love the way the children explained it as being good people, as being people who have good manners. I thought that was wonderful. We, in our church, we, Jesus has said that we have been blessed to be a blessing. We have been told to pick up our cross and follow Christ in service to others. A call to service flows not from a place of obligation or guilt. We don't serve as though we're wiping our debt clean because we have something filled on our ledger. We don't serve because we have pity for other people, nor do we serve as a way of scoring brownie points with God. Instead, the call to service is born out of a place of love. Love for the world that God loves, love for humanity, love for people created in the image of God, love for people who are poor and sick or hurting or lost, who are without a home, who are residing in prison, who are from another country, people of our own family or our neighbors or our friends or our siblings in Christ, people who love us and even, Jesus says, people who don't. Our service flows from a place of love, and that is the true measure of greatness. It's not just something we do, it is who we are meant to be in Christ as followers of Jesus. But wow, wow is it hard. I don't know if you find it hard, but I do. I find it hard because oftentimes it requires letting go and surrendering, surrendering our egos, our need to be in charge and in control. I, that's my struggle. Our need and desire to be first, our hunger for recognition and gratitude, our bias in the stories we tell ourselves about people we don't know. That is what makes today's story in the Gospel of Mark so telling, because here we see just how hard it is to live into Christ's call to service as a norm and a value that we live. Here we see James and John, disciples that have been with Jesus from the very beginning, and they've been with him for three whole years. And now we find them scheming, scheming. Did you see, did you, I don't know if you thought of it the way I did, but they're scheming to be first, to have the place of honor above and before all their other brothers who all believe Jesus is the one sent by God to save them and who have given up so much to be with him. Is this what they're asking for? Have they not learned anything in those three years? And their request comes immediately after Jesus has said for the third time that the road they are traveling on will lead to his death and suffering. Yet none of that matters. None of that matters to James and John because their eyes are focused on the throne they believe Jesus will ultimately sit upon when he comes into the fullness of his glory, and they want to be on that throne with him. That is the measure of greatness 
that they are striving for. Because as they're concerned, if you don't ask, you don't get. And we can understand that. We can understand that because in our own culture, when I worked on Wall Street, it was like that. If you didn't ask, you didn't get. And there was a whole lot of scheming going on. We can understand that because in our own culture, we define greatness, not necessarily the way the children did, but we define greatness by strength and power and status and wealth and influence and fame. To strive for greatness is to seek after those things. Those are the people we honor and revere. We erect monuments in their memory. We name streets and parks and buildings after them. We put them in positions of honor. We seek after their endorsements. We put them, we want to be like them, to be near them, to be with them. Jesus and John's action makes sense in their culture and it makes sense in our culture. But Jesus, Jesus came to show us another way, another way of living, another way of being in community with each other, another way in which our service and the giving of ourselves is the true measure of greatness. It may come with sacrifice, and we may be required to, don't, to deny our own glory but we are meant to be servants of Christ in a world so loved by God so that the good news of Jesus might not only be heard through our lips and by our words, but it might be experienced as we seek to glorify the Lord in everything we say and do. For Christ did not call us to a live, a norm, or a value that he did not embody. No, he came to serve and not be served. And in giving his life to that service, we be, he became a ransom for many whose sins would be forgiven through his sacrifice on the cross. Because of Christ, we have been set free to live another way, a way whose norms and values reflect God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. And the great news is that as hard as it may be, change is possible. It was true for James and John. They were scheming to be first, but we find later on in the book of Acts that James and John are right up there with all the other servants of God, committed to the good news of Christ, to the point where even they're willing to die for him. We are here today because of their willingness to give of themselves. We are here today because of so many others. There's, I've heard stories about people who've gone on before us who were members here at this church who gave of themselves in service time and time again of their time and their talent and their treasure. And we are here because of them. And so, my brothers and sisters, likewise, may our service, may our giving of ourselves be the legacy that touches the generations to come and draws them closer to Christ in whose service is the true measure of greatness. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you, Lord. We struggle sometimes with this faith that is within us. We struggle sometimes with the things to which you call us to do and to be. But we know that by your Holy Spirit and by you at work within us, that change is possible. Help us, O oh God, to live into the call to be servants. Help us to embody that. Help us to be the hands and feet, the heart and voice of Christ in this world that is in such need of people who seek after their welfare and love. 
We pray all of this, O oh God, in the precious name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Together, my brothers.